Well, hello and welcome. My name's Julie McCrossan, and 10 years ago, I was treated for a head and neck cancer. And today we're offering you an expert briefing about a promising treatment for squamous cell carcinomas of the skin on the head and neck. And a squamous cell carcinoma is a kind of cancer. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gia Jenny Liu, a medical oncologist and researcher at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney and the Kinghorn Cancer Centre, and Dr. James Pham, a medical oncology trainee at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre and St. Vincent's Hospital, Sydney, and also a dermatology research fellow at Liverpool Hospital in Sydney, where James, by chance, also works on occasion with my brother, Dr. Ian McCrossan, who happens to be a dermatologist, a skin cancer doctor. So welcome, guys, to both of you. Look, just to cut straight to the chase, Jenny, we're not talking about melanoma skin cancers, which we've heard a lot about. We're talking about squamous cell carcinoma. I hope I'm saying that correctly. What do they look like and how are they usually treated? And then what is this new treatment we're talking about today that is so promising? Yes, thanks so much, Julie, for having us and very pleased to be here today. So today we'd like to focus on squamous cell carcinomas of the skin. It is really the most common cancer that we face in Australia um, thanks to the UV and the beautiful sunlight that we have here. And whilst it is very common, it's very different to melanoma, which I guess has been a lot more in the media because of the fact that melanomas have a tendency to spread and to become potentially life-threatening if not diagnosed and treated early. Both of these cancers arise due to sun exposure, but there are some people who are more prone to get these cancers and where these cancers can lead to more problems. James is probably more of an expert in terms of differentiating them and detecting them early, but certainly their appearance um, is very different. The majority of melanomas are dark or have pigment, um, whereas the squamous cancers tend to be more scaly um, and not as pigmented. So just coming to you, James, if I may, Dr James Pham, could you just explain how are these squamous cell carcinomas, these ones when they come on the, the face of the neck, how are they generally treated? And when do they need this, this new treatment that is so promising? So thanks so much for having us, Julie. The majority of squamous cell carcinomas pop up on the skin as scaly tender bumps, like Jenny mentioned. So uh, the majority of the time, about 95%, they can be cut out with surgery and they, they're considered cured. Sometimes a bit of radiotherapy, which you've had quite a bit of experience with, is needed as well. Um, but oftentimes these are considered one and done treatments that cure the cancers. However, in that one in 5% or one in 20 in whom this isn't able to cure, that's the patients who have the cancers come back even after initial treatments or the cancers are too big to be cut out or treated with radiotherapy or if they've spread to other parts of the body. In these cases, these patients are eligible for immunotherapy, which is a medication that's given into the vein and aims to work to treat the cancer systemically, not just locally on the skin itself. And we're, I'm sure we're going to discuss the intricacies of what's involved in that a bit later. Well, let's imagine, uh, if I may, Jenny, that uh, James has seen a, a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the skin that needs this advanced treatment, this extra treatment, and so he's referred that patient to you. What happens next? This, hap uh, this situation happened actually this week, so uh, very serendipitous that you've mentioned this. So when patients have had recurrence of this cancer despite prior surgery and or radiotherapy, 
or the cancer has spread. Uh, this is when these patients end up in the oncologist's clinic and we discuss drugs treatments that have now been shown to be quite promising in these cancers. These drug treatments historically were chemo, but the chemotherapy unfortunately had high side effects, a short period by which they could control these cancers. But in the last decade, we have seen um, exciting developments with the discovery of immunotherapy um, immunotherapy works by boosting patients' immune system to recognise and attack cancer. And these infusions, when given uh, once every three weeks through the uh, vein, can sometimes in half of patients lead to substantial shrinkage and sometimes cure as well. Okay. So in a nutshell, why are you so excited by this treatment, because you are both very excited by it, I know. From a patient perspective, why is it exciting that these treatments have emerged? Jenny? Yeah, so I'm really excited by the potential of immunotherapy, both in the context where patients have had prior surgery um, and facing an incurable disease because uh, one in five of these patients can be cured and these medications in the majority of patients have fairly minimal and manageable side effects. The other aspect I'm very excited about is in the context of using these drugs in the beginning. So when patients have a large or a difficult to treat cancer, potentially something, say, in the head and neck area, in the nose, near the eye, around the mouth, where surgery would be very um, morbid and very extensive, using these drugs have been shown to potentially uh, reduce the extent of surgery and then in some t cases even avoid the need for disfiguring surgery. I was going to ask you the meaning of that word morbid. What does that mean to you? I'm not a surgeon, but in my mind, morbid surgery is one where it would leave um, a functional problem. So, for example, losing the eye, um, needing to have part of the nose or part of the mouth cut out, which then affects your swallowing, speech, etc. And because surgery can't be undone, even though it can you know, be very useful in cases to cure patients, it can leave long-term difficulties with patients' vision, speech and swallow. Let me come to you, James, because I know both of you feel very strongly that multidisciplinary teams are critically valuable uh, to patients, particularly the sort of patients we're talking about here. Why are MDT so important? And we'll have members watching. So why are they so important? And what's your advice to patients in relation to them? So that's a great question, Julie. To start, I'd like to describe what an MDT is or for people who might not be fully around it. But essentially, I like to think of it as a think tank where a person puts forward a case that they've come across and rather than just dealing it within one particular scope of practice, whether that be in the dermatology, surgery, radiotherapy sphere, we open the discussion to a forum of specialists across these specialties so that everyone can provide insight into what each can offer and as a think tank, come up with the best or most holistic plan for that individual patient. So the reason Jenny and I are so passionate about the role of MDTs in managing squamous cell carcinomas of the skin is that oftentimes we find that patients who have the opportunity to be treated across different treatments, um, if they are referred early, there's a better chance that these conversations can be started and the patient is aware of what options that they can have instead of feeling as though there is only one choice at any point in time, just knowing that there are some things out there for them to consider if and when they are appropriate. And you're particularly passionate. I mean, you're training to be a dermatologist, aren't you? Um, a, a special kind of dermatologist. You can explain it to me. But you're passionate about bridging the gap between dermatologists or skin doctors and oncologists, cancer doctors. Why is that gap got to be closed in your view? 
Yeah. So at the moment, I'm not on the dermatology training program yet. And it's something I really am working towards um, with a lot of help from your brother, as you mentioned. But a big reason why I'm so passionate about this is it really is heartbreaking to see patients who've come into this clinic for a skin check and be finding another skin cancer on their on their skin and they've already been through so many surgeries so many radiotherapies and yet the cancer either comes back or it pops up somewhere else oftentimes when these patients are then referred to medical oncology it could be to you for lack of a better word too late because a lot of the times these treatments they may work at, at different levels depending on the stage of the cancer and by that i mean some of the studies suggest that the treatments when they're given to patients whose cancers are more advanced or more recurrent may not work as well as when they're given earlier so this is a really emerging concept so i just really would love to be able to um, advocate for the role of an MDT so that patients who have these tricky conditions can be referred so that these conversations can be started earlier in the treatment journeys. Look, thank you. Coming to Jenny, you are, of course, a, a working medical oncologist as well as a researcher uh, at the bedside, very much involved with patients as well. Tell us a bit about clinical trials and their role in relation uh, to these squamous cell carcinomas of the skin on the head and neck that require this advanced treatment. What's the important message about clinical trials to both patients and members of the MDTs, the teams? So clinical trials are research studies that involve patients and provide an opportunity for patients to access new treatments that are not yet widely available or approved. And it's also to answer a research question of, is this new treatment effective? Is it safe? What's the right dose? And when should we best use this new treatment? So there are different stages of trials. And here at the Kinghorn, we're fortunate to be involved across all stages of clinical trials for patients with many different types of cancer. These trials go through a very rigorous process where they are reviewed by experienced researchers and also doctors and um, an ethics committee to make sure that the study is conducted in a way that um, puts the patient's interest in safety first. Um, when we look at a clinical trial for patients with these squamous cell cancers, the ones we have open and there's a lot of interest at the moment is exploring what the role of immunotherapy is for patients with difficult to treat head and neck cancers um, and seeing how we can use immunotherapy prior to surgery uh, to reduce the extent of surgery and to improve outcomes for patients. I was just going to say there are several of these trials open at the moment and we have seen some very promising uh, results. Look, our time is almost up, but just for our patients and family who may be watching this, just remind us as simply as you possibly can, what is immunotherapy and how does the patient receive it? Is it a pill or is it a, a drip into your arm? Yeah, so immunotherapy is a medication. It's given as a drip into the vein and it works by boosting patients' own immune system to recognise and attack cancer. Great. Well, look, just to close, what's the single most important message you want patients to remember and you want uh, clinical professionals in the teams to remember? Patients first, please. Oh, that's a great question, Julie. I think if there's one thing that I would like patients to take out of what we've discussed today, it's not that every one with squamous cell carcinoma should be asking for immunotherapy, but I just want them to be aware that beyond surgery and radiotherapy, there are certainly more options that can be discussed, whether that be approved treatments or available just for, on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme or in clinical trials. And to the best way for patients to be able to hear about and find more about these treatments is by 
knowing that there are other specialists out there and there are MDTs or think tanks out there where they can advocate for these different treatments for that patient. And for medical professionals, I think one key message that I've um, wanted to share based on my own experiences across the dermatology and oncology clinic is it's always possible to advocate for your patients. So even if you're seeing them for a skin check and you notice that through the pattern of their care, their treatments have been costing them a lot of time, a lot of side effects, a lot of money, getting to and from radiation therapy, losing a lot of time away from work, it's always possible to advocate for that patient in front of you and putting their interests first, whether that be putting them into an MDT, referring them for clinical trials, or referring them to other specialties, because at the end of the day, that's what is going to make the most difference to that patient. And that's something I'm truly passionate about, Julie. Look, guys, thank you so much. Uh, I, I want to thank Dr. Gia Jenny Liu, a medical oncologist at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital Sydney and the Kinghorn Cancer Centre, and Dr. James Pham, uh, a medical oncology trainee, a dermatology research fellow, uh, also at St. Vincent's and Kinghorn and also at uh, Liverpool Hospital in Sydney. And we're going to put uh, information in the text at the bottom of this YouTube clip uh, about each of the doctors that we're speaking to, but also links to information about the topic we've been discussing. My name's Julie McCrossan. Thank you so much for joining us.